I'm not really surprised that the Israelis are doing what they're doing. That's their nature. Zionists are invaders. They are colonialists. They are thieves. And what does a thief do? do? Hmm. A thief steals from you, robs you. This is what they're doing. They will continue to do, the, to do this until they are no longer able to do it. Dr. Azam Tamimi, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you back on the show after some time, but uh, jazakallah khair for, uh, for, for coming today. The last time we spoke, uh, we discussed the Arab Spring. And alhamdulillah, actually, uh, I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of our listeners contact us about just the optimism in your voice about the Arab Spring. I mean, I had interviewed a couple of guests prior to you and uh, it was seemingly negative. And of course, they all had their positive slant to it. But alhamdulillah, you were able to, to show the, the positive side to the issue. And I wonder whether there is anything positive to say about today's subject of Palestine. So the issue of Palestine has been a longstanding issue, uh, a catastrophe, I suppose, facing the Ummah uh, today. Um, I think it competes with a litany of violations against the 1.8 billion Muslim community. Our numbers, our resources, our education, our money does not seem to help us in resolving this and many of the other problems that we face. Instead, many of our Arab and Muslim countries make cheap trade deals and security packs with Israel, and they see uh, they begin this process of uh, normalization uh, which allows Israelis to travel with impunity in the Muslim countries. Dr. Azam Tamimi, you are one of the most important campaigners, I believe, against what has become commonly known as the apartheid state of Israel. Today, I would like to start from first principles to understand the conflict for what it is. I want our viewers to appreciate why the present looks so bleak, but also I want our, your views on the future and whether this also uh, can, whether the future can be positive as you discuss with the Arab Spring discussion. So please excuse me in advance if my questions come across as a little basic. But can I start with your family? You were born in Hebron in Khalil, uh, which is part of the West Bank. Uh, tell me about your father, about your family, the Tamimis, and um, where they were when the Nakba took place in, in 48. Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim uh, The Tamimis of Palestine uh, are not the same as the Tamimis of the Arabian Peninsula. The Tamimis of Palestine are said to be the descendants of Tamim ad-Dari, mm. who was a Christian. Tradition tells us even a wine merchant who heard about the Prophet sallallahu yes. alayhi wa and traveled to see him in Medina and embraced Islam. Um, now, my uh, ancestors have been there since then and since even before Islam arrived in Palestine. Right. Um, now, Hebron has been their uh, place. Um, part of our family lived in Beersheba. Beersheba is, uh, or in Arabic, Rissaba. Mm -hmm. It's a city or a town in uh, the Negev Desert, a Naqab in Arabic. And that's where my mother was born. Um, in 1948, uh, my maternal uh, grandparents, uh, hearing the news of the massacre uh, perpetrated by the Zionists against the population of Deir Yassin, started, they, they panicked and decided to leave. And they were hoping that would only be a matter of days mm. when uh, they'd be back again uh, once this issue was resolved. Right. And, and the reason for this is that many Palestinians really did not expect uh, the Jews in Palestine to do what they did to them. Mm. Um, because Palestine was a welcoming land, like all territories belonging or ruled at the time by the Ottomans. Mm. Jews were being persecuted elsewhere in the world. So if they came to Palestine and settled peacefully, that was not really a big issue. Mm. And uh, I think many Palestinians were naive at the time, not realizing that this was a colonial project. 
uh, part of which was the process of settlement, bringing the Jews, settling them, turning them into a militarized community mm. to terrorize and uh, dispossess the, the Arabs or the Palestinians. So in 1948, uh, the family of my father, of my mother, left Be'er Saba or Beersheba yeah. and joined the rest of the family in Hebron. And that's when uh, my father saw her and apparently uh, loved her and uh, they got married. Oh. <laughs> um, at the age of eight, uh, of course, uh, that was long after the Nakba, because the Nakba happened in 1948. I was born in 1955. Right. And when I became about eight years old, we were told we had to travel to Kuwait because that's where my father uh, ended working. So we joined him. Prior to that, uh, as a young man, my father was a fighter as part of the Palestinian resistance led by uh, Abdul Qadr al-Husseini, rahimahullah. But the Nakba happened and the land was lost and the battle was lost. Mm -hmm. We ended up uh, losing uh, two thirds of Palestine. Yes. I remained in Kuwait until I finished high school yes. in 1974. Then I moved to the UK where I did my A levels and bachelor degree. Right. And since then, I've been just uh, a traveler <laughs> <laughs> moving here and there. Did your father ever tell you about the Nakba and um, the impact it had on him and the Palestinians at the time? I. Probably won't be wrong if I were to say that this is part of every Palestinian sure. life. I mean, yes. uh, we grew up learning about Palestine, about the Nakba, about the loss. We lived the loss because in 1967, when my own hometown was occupied, when we were in Kuwait and we couldn't go back, I, I, I experienced that loss. Um, so yes, the Nakba, Palestine, and every single thing that is associated with the struggle mm. is part of our daily bread. Mm. Some 700,000 Palestinians were depopulated from the land. I think some 500 villages were, were burnt to the ground, were, were, uh, and, and uh, either they were killed or they had, to, they had to flee. The impact this must have had on on the Palestinians would have been would have been great. I mean, did your did your parents did your family see any of these violations against them? Well, as I mentioned earlier, my uh, maternal uh, grandparents left town oh, yes. because they knew or they heard the news that these Zionist gangsters were massacring Palestinians. Yes, and I think that was uh, that was the design by the Zionist movement, right. just to orchestrate a few massacres here and there and mm. frighten the rest of the population out. Yeah. Uh, so this is what, what we know, but they left everything behind. They lost their property. They lost... My mother uh, went back and visited her house yeah. uh, sometimes in the 70s, I think 1974, really? as I was uh, doing my exams for high school. Mm. The family left me in Kuwait and went back Palestine, uh, during those days, if you have family members in the occupied territories, they could apply for you to come as a visitor. So they went as visitors, Yes. Uh, spent uh, a few weeks, and she went and saw her house. And we have a picture of her there standing with my father and my uh, elder sister, some other members of the family. And uh, she begged the, occup the occupants of the house to allow her in. Mm. I think the house was, had been turned into some sort of a society, or a government agency or something. Right. And uh, she was told, uh, go back where, wherever you have come from. Uh, or not, you don't belong here. And she sat under a tree in front of the house and, and wept. Heavily. That was the last time she ever saw it. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that every Palestinian family ha has similar stories to tell. Yeah. 
the Israeli position on 1948, the Jewish position or the Zionist position on, on this period is that um, it, was a, it was a time where the historic owners of the land returned back to Palestine. So there is a historic claim to Palestine. And I think many in the West who may not follow these events very carefully, they have that impression, uh, that idea remains quite strong amongst, especially the Americans, that uh, the Jews that live in that land today have a historic right over it. I and mean, how do you respond to that claim? Well, that, that, that is a claim that every single colonial uh, power made, actually. Really? Um, even long before uh, colonialism, yeah. when uh, the white man of Europe conquered what is today the Americas, uh, that white man of Europe pretended to be the Israelite coming back to the land of Canaan. Hmm. Um, so if you're committing a crime against another people, yeah. you need to justify it somehow. And there is no better way, there is no stronger way to justify it than blaming it on God. So you just uh, claim that God gave you the license, God gave you the land, yes. this was the promise, etc. Of course, as a Muslim, um, I do recognize, I mean, the Quran tells us that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, did have a covenant with Abraham, with Ibrahim alayhi salam, and that the Israelites at, at one time were uh, chosen for a mission. Yes. But this is just like any other community chosen for a mission. If you fulfill the mission, then the, you are the chosen people of, of the Lord. But if you betray that mission, you are no longer chosen. Hmm. The same applies to the Muslims, where Allah SWT says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةً أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You are the best uh, nation ever raised for mankind, provided you do the following. Uh, you enjoy the good, forbid the evil, and believe in God. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولَ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا because you will bear witness. How do you bear witness? By conveying the message. The Israelites at one time were given that mission. Now, the interesting thing that uh, people probably don't bother to learn or uh, talk about is that when the Muslims arrived in Palestine in about 638 AD, there was not a single Jew in Palestine. Really? The Jews had already been removed, dispossessed, forced into the diaspora by the Romans, right. not by the Arabs, not by the Muslims. Sure. And, there was, and the, the, the community that remained in Palestine was the Christian community. And it was with that Christian community or with its head, uh, Sophronius, that Umar ibn Khattab, عنه, the second caliph, uh, signed the pact. Um, so you see, Anybody who claims that after thousands of years, you remember that you have, uh, you, you were given a divine uh, promise and that uh, this land belongs, belonged one day uh, to your ancestors thousands of years ago, it's not acceptable from any religious community around the world. It's, it's, it's just accepted from the Zionists. Right. I mean, imagine the, 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 the democratic West that claims to believe in human rights, in civil liberties, in fundamental values of human equa uh, equality, of justice, etc., would not tolerate such a claim with any community, but tolerates that claim because it's made by uh, the Zionists. And, and, that, and they, there is an explanation for this. The explanation for this is that the Zionist project is not really a Jewish project. It's a Western originally a Western colonial project, Western European colonial project. Right. And uh, evidently today, Israel receives a lot more aid from Christian Zionists than from Jewish uh, Zionists. So this is a colonial project that had its own objectives. It, it had, uh, in the beginning, it was intended to make sure that the collapsing Islamic empire would never regroup again, would never stand on its uh, feet again. Yeah. Uh, and that the Jewish problem, which really uh, bothered the Europeans and uh, 
caused them pain for so long because they couldn't, they didn't know what to do with it, could be resolved, could be resolved by exporting the Jews, whom the Europeans considered to be uh, a burden, to somebody else's homeland. And uh, it is no wonder that the only member of cabinet in the British cabinet that uh, approved the Balfour Declaration uh, in 1917 was the only Jewish member of that cabinet. Because he saw that the idea of sending the Jews to Palestine was an anti-Semitic uh, idea. There wasn't a service to the Jews. They wanted to uproot the Jews from whatever communities, whatever communities they were living in and send them somewhere else. And actually, most of the Jews were not convinced, did not buy the Zionist uh, uh, propaganda until Hitler came. Hitler did the greatest service to the Zionist project because he proved to the majority of the Jews who lived in Europe that Europe was no longer safe for them. And they started uh, acquiescing or accepting uh, the, uh, the Zionist claim that the Zionist movement uh, was aimed at rescuing the Jews from persecution in Europe. I want to talk about the contemporary politics and, um, and expand actually on uh, the, the motives uh, for continuing to support the Zionist state of Israel. But uh, let's go back to the beginning of the 20th century. So um, Israel, Palestine at the time was uh, a, uh, a part of the Ottoman Empire. And as you said, quite rightly, that the Ottoman Empire was crumbling and it, it began to disintegrate. And in the First World War, the Ottoman Empire ceased to exist as a, as a multi-ethnic, multinational empire. And uh, Palestine was was taken by the British. Now, one of the claims made against the Ottomans is that Palestine was never regarded as being so important. It was not um, seen to be a central part of the Ottoman Empire or Sultanate. And um, in many ways, it remained a backwater in inverted commas uh, and, and, and not really a, a, a locus for investment and, and um, opportunity as, as maybe other parts of the empire was. I mean, how, how, how credible do you find these claims? Well, Palestine was one of the most affluent uh, regions in the Arab world at the time. Really? Um, if you went to Jaffa or went to other cities, to Jerusalem, etc., they were so vivid. Um, but that's not really the issue. Right. <laughs> um, of course, the Zionists can make whatever claim they want. They even claim that uh, Palestine was nothing but a desert, which is, which is a lie. Yes. Uh, uh, Jaffa oranges, people knew Jaffa oranges long before Israel came to, into existence. Yes. Um, the olives of Palestine too, and Palestine was, I mean, it overlooks the Mediterranean. It is part of the territory that links three continents, yeah. Europe, Asia, and Africa. So it's very strategic. But what is really a lot more important than any of this is its religious status as far as the Muslims are concerned. And uh, uh, as I talk to you now, actually, we are, we are, we are living the moments of Al-Isra' wal miraj because this is almost the anniversary these yeah. days. Yeah. And that incident, that event, which took Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu at night from Mecca to Jerusalem, to Al-Quds, and then from Al-Quds to the upper heavens, is documented in the Quran, uh, is celebrated by Muslims every year, mm -hmm. is marked, not celebrated, but is marked by Muslims yeah. every year. Uh, because it was a very significant ev uh, event in the sense that even though the Muslim community in Mecca was still being persecuted, yeah. still being oppressed, that journey was made possible for the Prophet to give him the signal that his mission was very soon going to... Uh, go out of the bounds of Arabia hmm. 
extend beyond any geographical barriers uh, to reach the entire world. So, and, and this was actually the moment when Mecca and Al-Quds uh, were uh, rejoined as um, sister holy sites, if I may uh, des describe them as such, yes. um, to the extent that since the uh, Muslims took over, pilgrims performing Hajj every year, coming from the north in particular, from the northern parts of the world, from northeast, the north, and the northwest, had to pass through Bayt uh, al-Maqdis. And this is where the Ottoman played a, a crucial role in uh, providing facilities for the pilgrims. My own town, Al-Khalil, for instance, yes. uh, we had a huge uh, water reservoir similar to the other reservoirs that the Ottomans built along the path of the pilgrims from Istanbul all the way to Mecca. Uh, in, in other words, there was recognition that this was a very important site for the Muslims. Mm. And uh, uh, this is actually in line with the Islamic uh, doctrine that considers Mecca to be the holiest, Medina the second holiest, yes. and Bayt al-Maqdis the third holiest. And the, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu very uh, clearly tells us in the hadith that no journey in worship is legitimate except to one of these three places to the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, or to Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina, or to al-Masjid al-Aqsa in, uh, in Palestine, in, in, in Jerusalem. And I, I, actually, sometimes when I think about it, I think that those who came up with the idea of uh, creating a national home for the Jews in Palestine, hmm. turning Palestine into a Zionist entity, were so foolish by thinking that this was going to be tolerated by the Muslims. Muslims anywhere in the world, mm. this is part of their creed. Yeah. This is part of their faith. This is really what matters. Maybe that was the plan. You know, it, it is a, a symbol of our decline, possibly, or, or our inability to resolve these problems. I mean, Palestine is so spiritually connected to the Ummah, yet um, if anything, we're seeing that uh, Arab countries are normalizing relations with this state, and the Abraham Accords uh, gives uh, gives uh, uh, Israel a lot more breathing space than it's ever had in the last few decades. I mean, it, how how would you? Well, I have a different yeah. reading of all of this. Yeah, I think the Abraham Accord is a desperate attempt hmm. to save Israel. Really, and it's not going to work. Uh, you see, when you started, you described the current situation as bleak. Yes. To me, it's not bleak at all. Really? Um, what's going on at the moment is really a desperate attempt to prevent the uh, decline and the collapse of Zionism. Um, the brutality that the Israelis are using against the Palestinians is also a sign that their entity is uh, entering into a dark tunnel. Uh, and we saw this in South Africa before. We saw this in Algeria before. We saw this in Vietnam. When a colonial power becomes desperate, becomes a lot more brutal, uh, and it seeks various... Uh, measures, various means of uh, bolstering the project that is anti-human and that is anti-nature. Uh, and that's why I'm really increasingly optimistic day after day. I, I, I can see that uh, Jerusalem, Palestine, and the rest of, of the region, because it's really all one problem, uh, is heading towards Liberation, liberation from colonialism, from Zionism, and from Arab despotism, because they're, they're working together at the moment. 
we have a, a period in our history, our Islamic history, where Jerusalem fell out, fell from the power, from the control of Muslims and uh, was taken by the Crusaders. And yes. I think it was a spell of a hundred years, give or take, where the Crusaders governed uh, this land. Can we take any lessons from this period to help us in navigating the problem of Zionism today? Of course, these were Crusaders who were Christians. And can we take any lessons from uh, the will of Salahuddin Ayyubi, who finally in, the, in Ramadan, in the Battle of Hittin, was able to liberate this land and return it back to uh, Muslim governance? Well, Hattin and the liberation of uh, Jerusalem was not really the work of one man. True. Yes, Salah Din led the army and his efforts, uh, Muslims uh, do remember with pride mm. and gratitude, but that was a generational change. A generational change that started a hundred years earlier, probably with the efforts of Imam Ghazali, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Hmm. Uh, and I, and we, see, we see the same thing happening today. Nearly a hundred years ago, uh, a revivalist movement was triggered in various parts of the, of the Muslim world, hmm. in the Indian continent, in uh, the Arab world, in North Africa, in Western Africa. And it takes time for that revivalist movement to bear fruits. And we are beginning to see it flowering and hopefully it will bear fruits uh, quite soon. I think the Arab Spring was, was part of this process. Right. Uh, so your enemies look at you and they see signs of decline. They see signs of fragmentation, of decay. So they jump on you and they probably managed to defeat you. But that's, the end of, that's not the end of the story. Mm. The secret with the Muslims is not uh, something to do with race or ethnicity or geography. It's to do with the mission. And the mission is eternal. And the mission is preserved. No matter how low we decline at a certain time, we have the mechanism, we have the ability to come back. Yes. And this, this is what happened during the time of Salah al-Din Ayyubi, and this is what's, what's happening yeah. at the moment. And I know that some Israelis do recognize this, some, some scholars, really? uh, some Western scholars do recognize this. And now they are so frightened by the uh, drift that people are seeing in the Zionist movement from a secular endeavor into what is known as religious Zionism. Because they, see, they can see that this is actually heading into direct clash with an entire ummah, an entire ummah that has the potential to come back mm. and can never be defeated. Can you paint a picture of the current status of the West Bank of Gaza, of Jerusalem? Um, we often look at the atrocities that are taking place, but undergirding this, there is this territorial conflict where Israel is slowly taking more and more land from, especially in the West Bank, or particularly in the West Bank, from uh, Palestinians. C can you explain that for us so that our, our listeners, our viewers, get a vivid picture of what's really happening there? You see, there's been some confusion about this, some misunderstanding. I mean, if, if you have a colonial power invading you, yeah. you think they're going to uh, stop somewhere? Are they going to stop at a certain point and say, oh, we've had enough land, we don't want to take anymore? No, they will, they will continue to grab land. Yeah. So long as they are able to do this, they will continue. And I, I think the Palestinians, some of the Palestinians and some of the Arabs and some of the Muslims and some of the supporters of Palestine around the world were deluded by the talk about peace, right. about a two-state solution. And they thought, okay, probably some sort of settlement can be worked out whereby we can have 
the Jews living in a state called Israel and the Muslims and the Christians living in a state called Palestine. Mm. Nonsense. Even those who went to Oslo from the Israeli side were not going to allow this to happen. Um, so if you don't have, if, if, if you don't have an illusion about this, yes. and if you understand exactly how colonialism works, then you will know that it is inevitable. So long as they feel uh, strong, they feel protected from uh, accountability, that they can act with impunity, that they, they will take more land, that they will demolish more houses, that they will kill more of our, of our children, mm. that they will deny our people their basic rights, whether in Gaza or in the West Bank or the rest of Palestine, because they can do it. And that's why it's happening. So you see, we, it, is, it is about time to rectify this and go back to uh, understand what we are dealing with. We're dealing with a racist colonial project, mm. uh, not any less evil than apartheid of South Africa. Mm. I mean, what, what brought apartheid to an end? Simply the inability to continue. Yes. Uh, the people of South Africa became united in their determination to get rid of that enslavement. At the same time, the world started changing because of the resistance uh, put up by the uh, people of South Africa. Same thing will happen. It happened in Algeria, it happened in Vietnam, and it will happen in Palestine. So I'm not, I'm not really surprised that the Israelis are doing what they're doing. That's their nature. Zionists are invaders, they are colonialists, they are thieves. And what does a thief do? Hmm. A thief steals from you, robs you. This is what they're doing. They will continue to do, the, to do this until they are no longer able to do it. You talked about um, South Africa and the apartheid, the anti-apartheid movement and how international pressure ultimately worked and uh, internal activism ultimately worked. Um, we do have some level of internal activism, but it seems to me that international pressure is missing. I mean, if we think about uh, Britain and American public opinion, if anything, it's consolidating more behind uh, the Israeli government and its apartheid policies. I, I just remember, I mean, this time last year, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, within a week, the chief prosecutor of uh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, launched an investigation into the uh, possible war crimes of the Russians. We are yet to see uh, an ICC investigation into uh, the uh, war crimes on a daily basis against the Palestinians. And so, as you said, intimated earlier, there is a, a bipartisan support in the United States. There is a, a unanimous support amongst the political elites here. Um, and so where will that public pressure come from uh, to, uh, to, to end this Zionist project? But this, you see, the same thing happened in the case of South Africa. Really? Uh, peoples were increasingly supporting the struggle of the, of the people of South Africa, yes. but not governments. I remember uh, in the 70s, I was a student here. And even later in the 80s, when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister, that the British government, like almost every other Western government in the world, were fully supportive of apartheid. Yeah. See, when it becomes no longer uh, tenable, no longer um, bearable to continue to support such an, an inhumane project, that they will change their positions. See, politicians don't act uh, on the basis of humanity. Mm. They act on the basis of a reckoning, a calculation of uh, profits and losses. Yes. This is how they act. And it will happen. Same thing will be repeated in Palestine one day. Today, uh, the government of Britain, like the governments in the European Union, like the United States government, still believe that Israel can get away with its crimes 
they still believe that they have an interest in supporting this and in remaining silent. Uh, they still believe even in being partner uh, in, uh, in, uh, in such uh, a crime. But there will come a day when this will be too costly for, for them to continue. It will be too costly for the Israelis as well. Uh, you see, the world's position changes when there are sufficient uh, changes locally. Yeah. Had it not been for the struggle of the people of Algeria, Algeria would not have been liberated. Had it not been for the struggle of the people of South Africa, world public opinion would not have shifted. The same thing in Palestine, the people of Palestine have no option but to continue to struggle, continue to resist, continue to make the point that we cannot accept this invasion mm. being imposed on us. And then one day, this will trigger a change at the international level. I read an article of yours recently where you said the Palestinian leadership needs to change and we need fresh thinking and a new leadership uh, to, uh, to fight the Palestinian cause. What did you mean by this? And uh, what type of leaders would you like to, what type of leaders do you feel we need uh, to make a decisive change? Frankly, today, I don't see um, a Palestinian leadership capable of leading the struggle forward. We have two types of leaderships today. We have the leadership that is represented by the Palestinian Authority. Yes. And that uh, leadership to the majority of the Palestinians uh, is uh, a, a leadership that committed treason by Why? going to Oslo. See, because they've, they've recognized Zionism, they've agreed to accept Israel's right to exist on my, mo on my mother's land mm. and the lands of millions of other Palestinians in exchange for being recognized themselves as representatives of the Palestinians. So that type of leadership is lost. That it is a, is a sellout. We have another type of leadership. It's the leadership of the uh, resistance factions mm. like Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and probably some other mm. factions. And the way I see them uh, today is that they've been too embroiled in uh, regional and international politics. Yes. A leadership of a resistance project will have to remain, will have to maintain a clear vision. What is the objective? Where are we heading to? What do we want to achieve? And they have to have a clear vision as to who is the enemy and who is the friend. Mm. And this is my critique of Hamas leadership. Mm. Uh, these different uh, attempts to reconcile with the leadership of the Palestinian Authority, which all have come to nothing really, mm. total failure, yes. as well as being entangled in regional politics, having to throw yourself into Iran's bosom and coming back to make uh, uh, peace with the uh, Damascus regime. Yes. That has cost them a lot of credibility. I think the sort of leadership we need to we need to see is something like or similar to Nelson Mandela in South Africa, or probably to Sheikh Ahmad Yassin and the earlier generation of leadership in Palestine. Yeah. That you you see things for what they are. No confusion. Zionism is unacceptable, not on any part of Palestine. And this is not against the Jews. We have nothing against the Jews. Jews, Christians, and Muslims can still live together in Palestine as elsewhere, peacefully. But not with one community waging war against the other. Hmm. Our problem in Palestine is not with the Jews. As I mentioned earlier, the majority of the Jews initially were opposed to Zionism. Our problem in Palestine is with the Zionists who claim to have a divine right to dispossess my mother and my father. Mm -hmm. Earlier on, you talked about Israeli society moving decisively towards the religious right. Um, uh, the recent, um, the 
government of Netanyahu propped up by these religious groups that are very extreme in, in their um, uh, in their policies towards the Palestinians is is an illustration of that. What count accounts for this shift in Israeli public opinion, um, which which you know borders on fascism? I mean, it, it it looks and feels like fascism to me. I mean, what accounts for this shift? There is a a proportion of the Israeli public opinion that is horrified by what's going what's yeah. happening to Israel. Yes, but you see. This is really all the making of people whom others described as the doves at one stage. Rabin and Perez and the uh, left-wingers of all levels yeah. who started using settlement as a tool. You see, when you... Because, because le 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 let's talk a little bit uh, about international law. Yes. In the eyes of international law, so-called international law, actually there is, there is no international law. There is a law of the powerful in, yes. in this world we live in. But theoretically speaking, according to international law, the West Bank is occupied. And according to international law, and the European Union, Britain, even the United States of, of America accepts this, that according to international law, uh, Setting up settlements in the occupied territories is not acceptable. Yes. It's even a war crime, actually, according to the Geneva Convention, is a war crime. Yet, this world tolerated left-wing governments in Israel at one stage, expediting the setting up of settlements, the expansion of settlements, the confiscation of Palestinian land to... Uh, construct uh, highway uh, highways for the exclusive use of these settlers. And in order to encourage those settlers to come, they tolerated the religious justification of this theft of the land. I mean, I remember uh, once watching an interview conducted by a BBC uh, correspondent mm. with uh, a Jewish lady settler activist. Right. In a, in a settlement near my hometown, Hebron. And the, in, the, the interviewer was asking her, look at the Arabs. They're living there in the valley and you took their land here and set up your home. Don't you think this is wrong? And she said to him, had it not been for the fact that God told me I have the right to be here, I would be a criminal. Hmm. So the act is a criminal act, but it had to be justified. So bringing all these settlers, encouraging them to live in somebody else's land, in a land that is stolen from the Palestinians, mm. they needed some sort of an ideology. That's where this notion of the promised land comes, that you are the chosen people, that you have the right to steal from us, to kill us, to dispossess us, to do to us whatever that suits you mm. or suits your purposes. This is what gave birth to religious Zionism, which is a contradiction in term because Zionism, political Zionism, in its origins, is secular. It's, it's even atheists. The founding, the, fi the founding fathers of Zionism were atheists. And there's a, an excellent book by John Rose about this uh, uh, called uh, uh, the, uh, the Myths of Zionism. Mm. Uh, several other people wrote about this as well. There's a, an excellent book by Michael Pryor called The Bible and Colonialism. It explains the, ide the ideology behind justifying all this theft, all these crimes committed uh, against an innocent uh, people. So today, these fanatics uh, who are claiming to have a biblical right uh, to do anything to the Palestinians were actually invented by the left-wingers uh, in Israel in earlier days. And now probably they are regretting it. Are we on the verge of a new intifada in Palestine? It's possible, of course. I mean, yeah. we've had several intifadas before and why not another one? It's possible. Actually, Palestinian history, Palestinian modern history, over the past 100 years has been a history of intifadas. Mm. Every 10 to 20 years is a major 
ريزيستنس انتفاضة ريفوليوشن whatever uh, people want to call it mm. Back to the United States. So I, I mentioned there's an, uh, a bipartisan support in the United States uh, for support of Israel. I mean, you will find very rarely that there are topics now that unite the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, but Israel is one of those. Um, what accounts for this? Why is there such a strong political opinion in the United States? I, I note that a, a couple of weeks back, uh, Biden appointed a member to his human rights uh, commission. And it so happened that one member, it was found that he had sent out some social media postings which accused the Israeli state to be an apartheid state. And uh, within minutes, he was refused that position. Even though most of the human rights organizations within Israel and outside of Israel now label the state to be an apartheid state. What accounts for such strong opinion um, that seems unshakable towards this state? Well, there are a number of uh, reasons for this, I guess. Um, first, I think many Americans, mm. especially um, evangelical Americans, yeah. see themselves in Israel uh, the way it was created, the way it was uh, armed, the way it expanded. This is how the United, this is the history of the United States mm. of America. Yes. Uh, people coming from Europe, mm. uh, exterminating the indigenous population mercilessly, but using the Bible to justify this. Um, another reason is that the majority of Protestants in America believe Israel is a sign for the coming of their own Messiah. So there is a religious reason behind this. And if people are crazy to believe in such uh, ridiculous things, mm. there's really very little you can do about it. <laughs> um, but also the American political structure allows for this. The way people are elected to office. Yeah. You need money. Yeah. You need a lot of money. <laughs> to be, to really, it's as if you're buying your position. I mean, members of the Congress, members of whether it is the House of Representatives or the Senate, even governors, even a sheriff. <laughs> you have to have an election campaign. You need money for that campaign. So you're buying your way to the position. And uh, funding agencies uh, play a role in all of this. Uh, but I think it's, things are changing slowly, yeah. and not 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 rapidly, but they are changing slowly. And the interesting thing that we hear is that among the new generation of American Jews, this is also changing. Many of them are realizing that Israel doesn't represent them. The way Israel is acting with impunity, mm. committing all these crimes, war crimes included, does not represent people who live in America today and think uh, in an enlightened fashion uh, and uh, make comparisons. Such a vicious uh, image, such an ugly image of Israel that doesn't seem to be acceptable to them. Turning to the UK, um, we had a period under the Labour leadership of, care, of um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, where there was immense sympathy for the Palestinian cause. And Corbyn has, for many years, um, championed uh, Palestinian rights. But of course, that period uh, was marred with so-called anti-Semitism, and maybe you can comment on, on, on uh, the fallout from that. But we've now got a, uh, a, a centrist in, in, uh, in leadership of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, and uh, he wishes, as part of his uh, agenda setting, to reset relations with the Jewish community here, but also reset relations with uh, Israel. And um, uh, he has been pretty strong in his commitment to the Israeli state. Um, why is the Labour Party, why has that happened to the Labour Party? What is going on within the Labour Party uh, to, you know, 
it's almost, you know, the Labour Party's returned back to that Blairite standard, mm -hmm. which was... Um, even worse. Even worse, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's your, what's your view on that? Well, they, uh, all Starmer uh, wants really is to be the next prime minister. Mm. And uh, the, the, the people in authority inside the Labour Party mm. are convinced that you cannot become the next government in this country unless you are pro-Israel. Right. Um, they also convinced themselves that Jeremy Corbyn could never uh, take the Labour Party to government. I, 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 I would easily uh, uh, dispute that, but that, that's not the issue here. The issue is that they conspired against him. Mm. They conspired against many members of the Labour Party, including a large number of Jews who support the Palestinian cause and remove them from the, from the party. They expelled them or suspended them. And uh, I would like here uh, to remind of a brilliant documentary, a four-part documentary by Al Jazeera yeah. uh, called The Labour the Labor Files, which exposes that conspiracy, that plot that Starmer uh, sat on. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the irony here is that the British media did not even uh, mention that, that uh, documentary. Yeah. Although it is devastating for uh, the leadership of, of the Labour Party and the corrupt tactics they used uh, against people who uh, supported the, the cause of uh, Palestine. Now, I, I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that the establishment in this country, whoever that establishment happens to be, um, played a role in this. They decided that Jeremy Corbyn could never be uh, allowed uh, to, uh, to win an election in this country. Um, uh, and um, I don't know if you recall, but there was a time when a chief of staff, a former chief of staff or a, a, a current chief of staff, I don't remember, someone, a senior member of the army hmm. who said in an interview that the army would never allow someone like Jeremy Corbyn become a prime minister in this country. Hmm. Now, whether he was talking in his personal capacity mm. or he was actually represented uh, the deep state in this country, mm. the result was the same. We, we saw the Labour Party turn against uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, uh, and uh, it was a coup just like the coup against Morsi in Egypt in a, in a, in a very similar, similar manner. Can I ask you about the left wing in, in general and, and the support uh, many in, on the left gained from the Muslim community. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think Jeremy Corbyn was an, an honest man. And, you know, he uh, he uh, had deep sympathies for the Palestinian cause because he believed in in a justice, uh, in an understanding of what is justice. And I, I think he should be commended for that. But I also note that uh, the left who are heavily in favor of the Palestinian cause also deny atrocities in Syria. They support maybe the Assad regime. They have very pro-Russian tendencies. And, and of course, we know what the Russians did to our brothers and sisters in, in Aleppo and, and all across Syria. And, mm. and it's horrid what, what uh, they did. And, and of course, previously in Chechnya. Uh, there is this, I don't know, schizophrenia maybe in, in the left-wing movement where there is a very strong support for the Palestinian cause. But at the same time, um, Uyghur Muslims, I mean, again, you know, I'm hearing from many left-wing commentators that uh, the persecution of the Uyghurs has been exaggerated and China has been maligned and, and, and they frame it within the anti-imperialist struggle. How much do you believe we can seek support from such people who, who are contradictory in their political views and, and their, their understanding of justice? Well. If you ask me about my own experience, um, I was once uh, part of a movement that brought together uh, Muslims and the left in this country when we opposed the war on Iraq, Iraq yes. and the war on Afghanistan. Yeah. And actually, we, we worked in tandem. We worked very well together. 
we had a common cause, and that is to prevent a catastrophe. Mm. We agreed on Palestine, and we agreed on opposing the war. Mm. Yet, when the Arab Spring started, or when the Arab Spring, Arab Spring uh, was ignited, we started seeing differences, disagreements. Yes, many uh, lefties in this country were impressed by the people of Tunisia, probably to some extent the people of Egypt rising against a dictator. Yeah. But when it came to Libya, to Syria, and to Yemen, uh, I think they were overwhelmed by their uh, color blindness. Because for them, this world is about a conflict between the East and the West. Mm. And the West is American imperialism and its allies. Yeah. And the East is Russia and China, the former communists or the current communists, whatever they are, <laughs> <laughs> whatever remains of communism anyway. Mm. And uh, uh, actually, this affected the relationship between us and the left wing. And we lost some friends. In, uh, I used to be on excellent terms with George Galloway, for instance. Mm. Uh, we don't speak anymore mm. uh, because of this, because they failed to see that the people of Syria and the people of Libya were genuinely rising against a dictatorship. Yes. They wanted their right to be ruled by a government of their choosing. Yes. Uh, yet, our friends in the left, in this country, as well as in much of Europe, saw this as an imperialist conspiracy against governments that do not necessarily see eye to eye with the Americans and the Europeans, which is not true. Hmm. It's false. It's entirely false. Um, Muammar Gaddafi, toward the, 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 the last years of his reign, was on excellent terms with the Americans and with the Europeans, with the Tony Blair. He sold out completely. Uh, Bashar al-Assad and his father before were willing even to make peace with Israel. So this is, but the, the, the terms they were asking for were not uh, provided for. The issue we, we had disagreement over was whether the people of Syria had the right to choose, hmm. like the people of Tunisia or the people uh, of Egypt. And simply they couldn't agree. They couldn't uh, accept this. And it's, it's really regrettable because you have to have one standard, one ethical standard. What is wrong in Egypt, if it is repeated in Syria, is wrong. Mm. What is wrong in Tunisia, if it is practiced in uh, Libya, it's wrong. Yes. And this is also the same problem we have with the Iranians. The Iranians did not mind a revolution in Tunisia or in Egypt, but they con conspired against the revolution in Syria. They actually joined hands and arms with Bashar al-Assad to massacre the Syrian people. And this is something unacceptable for me as a human being and for me as a Muslim. I cannot accept this. And that's why I'm against the Iranians in this, in this sort of uh, policy. And I'm against the Palestinians who... Uh, praise the Iranians for whatever they claim uh, to be uh, a, a position worth, uh, worth uh, praising. Yes. If we believe in human rights, we have to believe in the equality of human rights. If we believe in democracy, we have to believe in the equal right of nations for dem to democracy. Mm. You cannot say it's, o it's okay for Egypt to be democratic, but not for Syria. Mm. That's not acceptable. Mm. I should have asked you this at the start. Have you ever returned back to your home in, in Hebron? And uh, have you prayed in Masjid al-Aqsa, Dr. Tamimi? Yes, I visited uh, Al-Masjid al-Aqsa twice. Mm. The, 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 well, well, more than twice, but the, 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 the two times I remember as uh, someone uh, growing up. The first was when I was around 10 years old in 1965, so yes. two years before the occupation of Hebron. Uh, I went from Kuwait together with my siblings. We went to visit our family in Al Khalil, yes. and we spent the summer holiday there. Uh, the second time I went after the occupation uh -huh. in 1972. Yes. 
And again, I visited Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And that was during the occupation. And we had to stay only for one month because that's what we were permitted. And then we returned to, to Kuwait. But since 1972, I haven't been back. And is that because of any uh, problem from, a, from the Israeli perspective? or I expect that it would not be safe for me to go. Mm. Uh, and there is a very high likelihood that uh, the Israelis might just take action. And if I, if I know this, it would be uh, unwise yeah. uh, to, to make, make that venture. I ask because um, you've been a, a campaigner for Palestinian rights, for the right to uh, oppose the apartheid state of Israel. Do you feel that in your lifetime you will have an opportunity to return back to a liberated Palestine and pray in Masjid al-Aqsa? Well, I wish and I hope, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't happen. Hmm. Uh, because, you know, for us as uh, Muslim uh, believers, what really matters is that you struggle against injustice. Do you see justice in this world? Allah alone knows whether this is likely to happen or not. We know there will be justice in the hereafter, but at least in this world, we have to be on the side of the victims of oppression. This is what matters. Dr. Tamimi, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Jazakallah khair for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.